In 1974, during a geological survey in the northern limestone Alps of Austria, researchers came across an unusual layer. Geologists Wolfgang Schlager and Werner Schoenberger found a dark gray band cutting abruptly through the light-colored limestone strata from the Triassic period. The color and structure of this layer did not match the typical pattern of carbonate rocks that had accumulated over millions of years. Normally, the remains of shelled marine organisms settle in shallow seas and form whitish, homogeneous deposits. But what they observed here contained an anomalous mixture. The layer was rich in silica, clay, and terrestrial mineral traces. This suggested that a large volume of land-derived material had suddenly entered the marine environment. And it wasn't unique to Austria. The same layer with similar features and at the same stratigraphic level was found in northern Italy, the Swiss Alps, southern Germany, and even parts of England. This formation wasn't local, it spanned a continental scale. And despite changing geographies, the layer always appeared at the same point on the geological timescale. Radiometric dating revealed that these layers dated back approximately 234 million years to the middle of the Triassic period. This meant that a major global change had occurred at that time. Moreover, the change was visible not only in the sedimentary sequence, but also in the fossil record. Within the same strata, sudden shifts in microorganism species, a decline in certain marine organisms, and the emergence of new species were all documented. Geologists describe this formation as a stratigraphic wend, a turning point. This gray band was like a thin line etched into the fabric of time. Something had happened and Earth had drawn that line on that very day. So what exactly happened 234 million years ago? Geological records show that during the formation of this layer, a series of events unfolded that triggered sudden and cascading reactions within the Earth system. It serves as a reminder of how a small beginning can lead to widespread consequences, just like in the butterfly effect. As the classic expression goes, a butterfly flapping its wings in the Amazon might set off a storm on the other side of the world. But what if that butterfly was the first crack in an ocean of lava stretching for hundreds of miles? If a butterfly can trigger a tornado, what might an eruption a hundred times larger than a supervolcano cause? During the Triassic period, most of Earth's landmass was part of a single supercontinent, Pangaea. This enormous land block offered an almost unbroken desert landscape. The arid belt that stretched across the mid-latitudes was surrounded by high-pressure systems that blocked moist air from entering. Oceans hugged the edges of the continent, while the interior remained scorched and motionless. This stillness might suggest that nothing was changing at the surface. But beneath it, a different story was unfolding. Because Earth's crust is not as thick as one might think. In some places only a few miles deep, this thin outer shell rests atop a vast, slowly moving energy system. While the surface appears calm, rising magma below builds pressure, eventually forcing the crust to its limits. Like an overstretched membrane, it's only a matter of time before it bursts. And the pressure that had been building eventually triggered one of the largest eruptions in Earth's history. A geological formation known as Rangelia, located beneath what is now Alaska, British Columbia, and the Yukon, suddenly became active around 234 million years ago. But this wasn't an ordinary volcanic awakening. Rangalia unleashed one of the most extensive lava flows ever recorded, transforming into a massive igneous province that left a permanent mark on the planet's geological record. This eruption went far beyond the scale of a typical supervolcano. While supervolcanoes usually involve short bursts of high-pressure release over a few hundred square miles, Rangelia poured out basaltic lava across hundreds of thousands of square miles, slowly but relentlessly covering vast portions of the surface. And just as significant as the lava's spread was what it released into the atmosphere. Billions of tons of carbon dioxide and methane continuously vented over the course of several million years. But the true impact of this event extended not upward, but downward. The lava rising from below didn't just heat the surface, it ignited vast deposits of fossil fuels buried within sedimentary layers rich in organic material. As these layers were heated, they underwent thermal breakdown, releasing not only carbon dioxide, but also far more reactive gases such as sulfur dioxide and various hydrocarbons. This spontaneous combustion of fossil fuels triggered a greenhouse effect on a scale beyond what natural cycles could buffer. And yet, there was something unusual about this event. Mass extinctions remained relatively limited. That's because Rangelia's emissions were not released all at once. 
they seeped into the atmosphere gradually over an extended period. This slower pace gave organisms time to adapt. In a way, it was a dose strong enough to alter the world, but not so sudden as to wipe it out. The first signs of this atmospheric shift began to appear in global temperature records. The multi-million year long lava outpourings from Rangelia didn't just bury the surface. They also dramatically increased the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Geological data shows that carbon dioxide levels during this time peaked at around 1,000 parts per million. That's roughly two and a half times the current concentration in Earth's atmosphere. And this wasn't a sudden spike. It was a slow, cumulative rise over millions of years. But even that was enough to tip the system out of balance. At those carbon dioxide, global temperatures rose by 3 to 4 degrees Celsius. While that may seem like a small shift, it was powerful enough to destabilize the climate system at its core. Because when temperatures rise, it's not just the air that responds. Water does too. As surface temperatures increase, oceans release more water vapor. And water vapor is one of the most potent greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So rising heat produces more vapor, more vapor traps, more heat. This cycle becomes a feedback loop, reinforcing itself with each turn. At that point, the planet's water cycle went into overdrive. Evaporation intensified, cloud formation accelerated, and rainfall patterns broke down. What used to be seasonal rains confined to monsoon climates now spread across much wider regions. Dry areas were hit with sudden downpours, while wetter regions were overwhelmed by near-constant rain. This new climate system began to rewrite the planet's balance between land and sea. Sediments carried by floods poured into the oceans. New minerals reshaped long-standing ecosystems. But this process wasn't limited to just water and heat. At the same time, the carbon cycle was thrown off balance. As atmospheric carbon dioxide increased, land plants began absorbing more of it, leading to a surge in biomass production. However, instead of building up in the soil, much of that biomass was swept away by floods, buried, or carried into the seas. The chemistry of the oceans shifted as terrestrial nutrients spilled into marine systems. For ocean life, that meant both opportunity and danger. In short, gas ratios in the atmosphere changed, sea levels fluctuated, sedimentary layers thinned or shifted. Amid this turmoil, climate was no longer shaped by a single driving force, but by the complex interplay of multiple internal systems. This new climate regime didn't stop at rising temperatures and humidity. The supercharged water cycle triggered the longest lasting rainfall episode in Earth's history. Geological data indicates that this rainy period didn't just last for a few thousand years. It endured for nearly two million years. And it wasn't just a wet spell. It was a prolonged, unstable phase composed of four distinct mega-monsoon cycles. Each cycle brought monsoon-like deluge to continental interiors, carving out valleys, flooding lake basins, overflowing rivers, and reshaping the land. It was a natural event without precedent. The ground became saturated beyond its limit. Rocks began to dissolve in constantly damp soil. Sedimentary layers turned into thick stacks of silt and clay. Forests morphed into swamps. Valleys became lakes and transient seas. Every known landmass had surrendered to the rain. But how could such a process last this long? Under normal circumstances, monsoons come and go, driven by temporary fluctuations in ocean temperatures. But this time, the cycle never stopped. The relationship between ocean warmth, atmospheric carbon levels, and land surface temperatures turned monsoons into a year-round phenomenon. The oceans couldn't release their heat, so evaporation became constant. The atmosphere carried that moisture continuously and had to release it over land. In the tropics, this system ran year-round. Seasons had effectively vanished. Yet in some places, the expected rainfall never came. This rain regime wasn't distributed evenly across the planet. Certain continental interiors and high-altitude regions were barely touched by the wet period. Areas that should have seen heavy monsoons remain dry. Without rain, temperatures rose, but humidity never followed. Disruptions in lower atmospheric circulation left some zones drenched while completely bypassing others. The prolonged rainfall didn't just affect the climate, it triggered processes that physically reshaped the Earth's surface. Because the water falling from the sky was no longer just water. The atmosphere, saturated with massive amounts of sulfur dioxide, carbon dioxide, and other reactive gases, turned rainfall into a cocktail of acidic compounds. 
In particular, sulfur combining with water vapor to form sulfuric acid dramatically lowered the pH of each drop. So every drop that hit the ground didn't just wet the surface, it actively dissolved it. Rocks couldn't withstand this new chemical regime, especially carbonate-based sedimentary rocks like limestone and dolomite reacted quickly when exposed to acidic rain. The rain, rich in carbon dioxide and sulfuric acid, didn't just affect the surface, it penetrated deeper layers. And it didn't happen slowly, it visibly etched the rock, layer by layer. Cracks widened, porous structures collapsed, and over time, microscopic dissolution gave way to much larger cavities. Some cave systems in southern England, dating back to the Triassic period, are now directly linked to this process. When geologists analyzed their formation ages, they found that many of these caves formed precisely during the Carnian pluvial episode. These weren't caves created by tectonic shifts or natural collapse. They were carved chemically. Rain hollowed out the rock from within. The stone dissolved and the empty shell gave way. As Earth's surface began to dissolve under the onslaught of acidic rains, the sharpest consequences of this transformation emerged in the oceans. The acidic runoff from land didn't just alter terrestrial rocks, it also began to reshape the chemistry of the seas. Millions of tons of dissolved carbonates, sulfates, and other ions flowed into the ocean, pushing its buffering capacity to the brink and gradually lowering its pH. The oceans began to acidify. In this process, oxygen levels in the mid and deep layers of the ocean started to drop rapidly. These low oxygen zones, known as anoxic regions, began to appear on a broad and persistent scale for the first time. For marine life dependent on oxygen-based respiration, this posed a critical threat. Dominant species of the Triassic seas, such as ammonoids, conodonts, and crinoids, could not adapt to the abrupt change. Around 30% of marine species vanished from the fossil record within a geologically brief span of time. Yet just after this silent collapse, something else stirred in the oceans. Microscopic plankton, known as dinoflagellates, began to thrive in this new chemical environment. Capable of photosynthesis, but also able to feed heterotrophically in some cases, these organisms turned acidic, oxygen-depleted waters into an opportunity. Their populations surged especially in surface waters, where sunlight still reached but biological competition had sharply declined. On land, a transformation just as profound as the oceanic collapse was underway. But this silence would soon give way to a slow, green explosion. The prolonged rainfall didn't just reshape the soil, it also began to transform the plant life. Constant moisture, elevated temperatures, and rising carbon dioxide levels accelerated the growth rate of vegetation. This major shift also triggered the formation of new coal deposits. The surge in biomass created ideal conditions for dead plant material to become buried and compressed. Especially in swampy environments, organic matter accumulated in oxygen-poor settings, giving rise to carbon-rich coal layers. This marked the beginning of a geological buildup that would one day become the foundation of future energy resources. Perhaps the most striking change was the re-greening of arid landscapes. The parched plateaus deep within Pangaea began to resemble tropical zones as relentless rains transformed them into humid regions. New forests took root, fresh ecosystems emerged along lake shores. Plants didn't just adapt, they altered the very nature of the terrain around them. But was this green explosion limited only to plants? The new world shaped by the Carnian pluvial episode created not only a transformed environment for plants, but also a radically altered arena of selection for animals. Species that had dominated for millions of years struggled to cope with the new conditions. Reptilian groups that had adapted to dry and stable climates suddenly found themselves vulnerable in the face of shifting humidity, rising temperatures, and evolving vegetation. Yet for some, this chaos was a geological lottery. Dinosaurs emerged onto this new stage at exactly the right moment. Although early dinosaur lineages had existed for nearly 245 million years, they had never achieved ecological dominance until now. Carnivorous dinosaurs like Herrerasaurus began to gain an edge, thanks to their physical traits and their ability to adapt to the changing habitat. With long limbs, agile frames, and efficient energy use, these species could hunt even on waterlogged terrain and outrun many of their competitors. This rise wasn't simply a matter of chance survival. Scientists referred to this process as a habitat lottery. The new climate regime had produced a complex ecosystem of humid forests and temporary wetlands. 
Success wasn't determined solely by anatomy. Only those species capable of sustaining their life cycles in this moist climate could thrive. Reptilian groups like rhynchosaurs and decinodonts, once well adapted to arid environments, lost access to food sources and experienced disruptions in reproduction. It wasn't just physical form that failed, it was biological rhythm itself that fell out of sync with the new world. This ecological transformation can be directly traced in the fossil record of the Dolomites. The Triassic sedimentary layers of the Italian Alps are filled with hundreds of distinct dinosaur footprints. Yet when these tracks are plotted on a timeline, most of them appear just after the Carney and Pluvial episode. In other words, dinosaurs didn't just appear, they steadily rose to dominance, step by step. This rise culminated in a dramatic transformation within just a few million years. In the three to four million years following the Carnian Pluvial episode, dinosaurs became the dominant organisms in nearly 90% of ecosystems. Diversifying plant life, the emergence of new prey species, and the expansion of wetland habitats, all of these factors accelerated dinosaur evolution. And at that precise moment, the throne was being passed. A lineage of reptiles known as archosaurs, particularly the ancestors of dinosaurs, seized control of the ecological game. This group would first dominate on land and eventually in the air and water as well. In this unfolding crisis, dinosaurs became the winners. And this newly established balance opened the door to an era that would last far longer. Dinosaurs were no longer just the victors. They had become the architects of a new world. Their reign, which would continue for 180 million years, began with this climatic reset. They spread across every continent, adapted to different climates and ecosystems, and diversified endlessly. They were no longer a species, they were the name of an age. Today, every living system walking the surface of our planet, forests, soil cycles, food webs, bears the legacy of the Carnian Pluvial episode. A single fracture that began in Alaska marked the threshold of an age that would reshape life for the next 180 million years.